Well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the School District Governance Association's um, webinar on how to write a right to know request. I'm Donna Green. I'm president of the School District Governance Association, and I'd like to welcome you. Our mission is to educate and empower elected school district officials, um, specifically school board members and school budget committee members. And in addition to our um, educational mission, we also have a legislative agenda. And this year we are working hard to get uh, collective bargaining negotiations um, conducted in public when both parties are present. And we also have three budget transparency bills before the legislature, um, basically requiring that um, budgets be presented to the public in full line item detail and in live spreadsheet format. Um, before I have the pleasure of introducing Right to Know New Hampshire and our guest speaker, David Saad, I'd just like uh, to mention a, a few webinar protocols that I'm going to be observing tonight. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, I have um, muted all the participants except for the speaker. Uh, he will be speaking for half an hour and then there will be, will be half an hour for uh, questions and I ask that during that time that if you have a question you um, type it into the chat box. I will be moderating the chat box and at the end of David's presentation I will um, organize the questions and um, ask them to address them and if time runs out and we don't have a chance to address all of the questions I will certainly reach out to you privately afterwards and make sure uh, your question is answered or at least direct you to the right person who can uh, answer it. So um, thank you very much. Um, now I would like to say a little something about um, our guest speaker, David Sad, president of Right to Know New Hampshire and um, about Right to Know New Hampshire itself. Um, it's a very impressive organization. David has been president of the organization for six years and in that time, he's grown it from a handful of transparency advocates to a statewide network of people who um, are, uh, advocating for um, transparency and um, making their voices heard and conquered. Um, one of the remarkable things about Right to Know New Hampshire is that it's very respected uh, at the State House for the work it's done to um, strengthen and clarify the Right to Know law um, since its inception, since the organization's inception. And uh, this year, the, um, the organization is um, pushing to get um, a, a right to know ombudsman established, an office of an ombudsman to adjudicate um, disputes between private citizens and public bodies so that the private citizen doesn't have to undertake the onerous cost of going to court to enforce their right to public information. Um, this has been uh, a goal of Right to Know New Hampshire for the past um, four years, and um, they've been very conscientiously chipping away, trying to um, move this goal forward. And, um, and under David's uh, very able leadership, the organization has been awarded the Naki Loeb First Amendment Award, and it's also been recognized by the New England uh, First Amendment Coalition for the work it's done in, um, in, tr in government transparency. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn over the presentation to um, David Saab, the president of Right to Know New Hampshire, who is available for presentations on invitation, by the way, if your um, community or a school district would like to have a presentation. Uh, David, I'm volunteering you. And, um, and in uh, all his spare time, he manages to be a full-time IT consultant in Romney, where he had served on the planning board for a number of years. So he knows the transparency issues from both sides of the table, so to speak. So with that, I'd like to turn over the presentation to David Sad, president of Right to Know New Hampshire. And thank you so much, David, for being with us. It's very generous of you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. My pleasure. Um... Donna did a, a very good job introducing me, so I, I don't think I'll have to say anything more about myself. <laughs> I'll move right on to 
um, the organization Right to Know New Hampshire, of which I am uh, president, um, and give you a little bit of background uh, of what we do. Um, we're a nonpartisan organization, and we focus on the Right to Know law and helping to um, strengthen that law at the legislative level um, and improve adherence uh, to that law around the state. Um, some of the things that we do, we educate citizens. That's why I'm here tonight. It's one of our um, uh, uh, goals uh, is to help uh, citizens exercise their right to know what their government is doing. Um, we, as part of that assistance, we provide resources. We have a blog that is a wealth of information uh, if you want to know about the right to know law above and beyond what you're going to learn here tonight, um, I suggest you go to that uh, blog. Uh, there's a, a great deal of, of information at your disposal. We're also uh, can be found on Facebook. Um, and as I said, we propose legislation um, to strengthen the law. Uh, as we'll be discussing here tonight, there are, I'm sure, going to be questions that We'll be discussing that will highlight some of the, the shortcomings in the law and we constantly um, try to propose legislation and get legislation passed that will strengthen a citizen's right to know what their government is doing. The foundation of right to know, you know, where did this come from? Well, uh, it's rooted in part one, article eight of the New Hampshire Constitution. Um, it's, it's our government. Uh, we uh, elect people to do various duties on our behalf, uh, but they are our agents and they're at all times are accountable to us. And that's uh, within the constitution. Um, further states, the government should therefore be open, accessible, accountable, and responsive. Um, and the key point for the discussion tonight is that uh, the right of access to governmental proceedings and records shall not be unreasonably restricted. Um, so we're going to go into um, the uh, level of um, access that you have, um, but it shouldn't be unreasonably restricted. The details of what gets codified in law as to what is reasonable <laughs> or not, some of it's codified in law known as the right to know law, RSA 91A. Hopefully many of you are already familiar with this law. It establishes a citizen's right to access uh, governmental meetings um, and governmental records. Uh, now today I'm gonna be discussing just the records aspect of the law. Um, I won't be touching upon um, access to meetings, but the law does cover both. And the preamble in the right to know law um, sets a good um, foundation. And it says openness in the conduct of public business is essential to a democratic society. The purpose of this chapter is to ensure both the greatest possible public access to the actions, discussions, and records of all public bodies and their accountability to the people. So uh, the preamble is making it uh, clear that um, openness is to be expected um, and the law uh, outlines that in more detail. So I'm gonna be talking about how to uh, do a right to know request. And of course, when you file a right to know request, you're at asking for access to governmental records. So the logical place to start, of course, is what is a governmental record? Um, and it is outlined in the law, quite specifically, it says it's any information that's created, accepted, or obtained by or on behalf of a public body or agency or a quorum or majority thereof in any format, whether it's paper, electronic, spreadsheets, et cetera, received at any time, whether it's in a meeting or outside of a meeting, doesn't matter. And the key here is in furtherance of the public body's official function. 
So if it meets all of those criteria, then that's considered a governmental record. So then the next step becomes, okay, um, that's a governmental record. That's sort of the universe of the records available. But then we have to drill down a little further and talk about, well, what is a public record? Because not all governmental records become public records. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about that here. Um, first, every person has a right to inspect public records. And this is something that um, has, has always been uh, in the law, although a few years back, Right to Know New Hampshire was instrumental in getting the law changed slightly to ensure that if all you do is inspect the records, you can do so at no cost. Uh, you can make uh, copies uh, of the record yourself if you bring your uh, you know, cell phone with you and you want to take a picture of it, you know, you're free to do that. You can make an abstract of the record, take any notes you wish. Um, and if you want a copy, you can ask the uh, public body for a copy. Of course, uh, copies, there would be uh, charges uh, for copies in most instances. Now, certain governmental records are exempt from disclosure and uh, I'm not gonna go into all the, the exceptions. We could spend a great deal of time just talking about those, um, but I will at a high level discuss uh, some aspects of this. Uh, first of all, I would direct you to uh, the Right to Know Law, RSA 91A uh, colon five lists all of the exemptions um, uh, that are in the Right to Know Law itself. Now, in addition to that list, um, uh, which by the way, that list is gonna cover things such as personnel files, uh, law enforcement investigation records, confidential information, commercial information, um, records that would constitute an invasion of privacy. Um, those things are enumerated in the right to know law. Uh, you also have to recognize that there's, there's other federal statutes, federal laws that might exempt records. A good example is HIPAA and the health related information of individuals um, uh, that are exempt because of the HIPAA laws. Um, there are also other state statutes that may um, uh, specifically exempt records that are not enumerated in RSA 91A. Um, for example, uh, some educational student uh, records um, uh, relating to um, uh, individual education plans or mediation agreements that came out of uh, student related uh, mediation efforts with the school so uh, you may find if you're doing research, uh, you've got to look at the, some other state statutes possibly to get full understanding of, of every uh, record that might be exempt uh, on the topics that you're interested in. Um, the public body uh, bears the burden of establishing that records are uh, exempt from disclosure. So by default, the record is, is available and is a public record is the starting point you work from. And then um, the public body would identify those which are exempt and they would have to explain that to you. And I'll get more into that in a minute. Uh, now there can be fees if you um, decide to ask for copies, um, but they can only charge the actual cost for making the copies. And they can't charge a fee if all you wanna do is inspect the records. Next uh, thing to give some consideration to is the retention requirements because you may be looking for records, but especially if you're going back in time, uh, there, there are 
um, listed in uh, various statutes the requirements for various state and, and uh, other public uh, agencies and uh, towns and school districts and the like uh, as to how long they have to retain various records. And so after that period of time, they're free to um, get rid of those records in, in whatever method they deem to destroy them. So there is a retention schedule. I'll look at to RSA uh, uh, five, for example, for state 33A for city and town uh, bodies, uh, school districts is 189. They also have to maintain uh, any settlement agreements that are the result of any claims or lawsuits, those have to be retained for 10 years. Now the records are retained um, in various formats. They can retain them in paper, microfilm or PDF uh, format. Uh, for electronic records, uh, such as email spreadsheets and such, those records have this follow the same retention schedule. There's no difference because of the, 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 the format the record is in. Uh, if they destroy records to prevent disclosure, that's a misdemeanor and, uh, and they can be uh, held accountable for doing so. And if you file a right to know lawsuit to pursue access to records, which they are denying, they have to preserve those records for 90 days while the lawsuit is pending. So how do you go about and exercise your right to inspect records? There's several steps that you need to go through. The first one is you need to make some decisions, uh, specifically what records do you wish to inspect? Um, now, uh, again, our blog is a great resource. We have a section just on this topic, how to request records, and you can go out there and read more about it there. Uh, once you decide what records you want, you also have to um, determine the public body which has possession, custody, and control of those records. And sometimes it's not as obvious as it might appear. So um, if in doubt, um, the best thing to do is um, ask around, uh, contact the town or the state agency or whoever uh, and, and see if they're the right place in, in order to uh, file the kind of request you're, you're looking to file. And I would then state that once you identify the proper custodian of those records, and keep in mind, there could be multiple custodians depending upon the nature of your request. And uh, so you may need to file multiple requests with multiple uh, custodians. Example might be, you might file a request with the police uh, chief in the town um, relating to some aspect of uh, uh, an expenditure around for police equipment, but then also uh, be filing with selectmen to get details on expenditures, uh, for example. Now, what you want to do with the with the custodian, if you're if it's something that you're not, you don't have experience in doing before, um, I would suggest that you uh, ask that custodian if they have a written policy on right to know requests. Uh, many of them do, and if so, get a copy of that because it will provide some guidelines. For example, it'll tell you who to submit the request to. It might tell you uh, whether or not they'll charge for copies, how much the cost per copy is. There's various things that might be in that policy, and it's just useful information before you submit your request. Um, and if you're not sure, discuss with the public body uh, what you're trying to gather for information and see if they can provide some um, guidelines or assistance um, to, to help you formulate your request properly. Uh, of course, Right to Know New Hampshire is a great resource too. We get uh, contacted from people around the state 
Uh, every year we get about 50 or so inquiries that come into our group asking for help uh, in regards to various things about the right to know law. And by far the majority of those uh, inquiries to us have to do with filing a right to know request. Um, next, decide which uh, record uh, format you want, right? Some records can exist in hard copy. They might be in a spreadsheet. They can be in both. Um, specify the format you want. Um, and decide whether you only want to inspect the records to ensure you can do so at no cost or whether you want to get copies and uh, maybe have to pay some fees. So once you've made those decisions, the next thing is to go and um, define uh, your request. And the first thing you got to focus on is reasonably describing the records that you're requesting. By law, it has to be reasonably described. So be as specific as possible without uh, excluding uh, records you may want. And make sure that you cover in your description the types of documents you're looking for, date ranges for the documents, and the formats you are seeking. So for example, you might want um, all uh, budget spreadsheets covering uh, the time period of July 1st through June 30th uh, 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 of a given year. Um, and any other information which can limit the search, including any exclusions that may be helpful. Um, you don't want to end up with more records than you need. You don't want to have to pay for more copies than uh, or copies of records that are not relevant. Be very careful how you word your request. The public body is not required to create records, compile data, or answer questions. This is by far the biggest area that people stumble upon because the natural tendency is you want to answer to a question. That's why you're filing a request. But you can't ask them the question. They don't have to answer questions. You have to formulate and ask for records, which will provide you with the information you need so that you can then compile the data or answer the question yourself. That's key. Um, and make sure you do your part to minimize the task on the part of the custodian to fulfill the request. Be clear, concise, and courteous. That always helps. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you can inspect the records uh, at no cost. Um, so if you only need to read the information um, and you want to save money, ask to inspect the records um, and uh, save the copy costs, avoid the copy costs. Uh, make sure you ask the public body to cite in writing any exemptions they're relying on if they decide to withhold any information. So uh, they are required by law to do so. That again was a, uh, uh, an aspect of the right to know law that we uh, put forth uh, a bill to get the law changed to make sure that they have to be specific in citing the exemption for records they're not providing. There's no requirement to identify yourself or provide any reason for the request. Now, naturally, it generally makes sense to, to identify yourself, but um, the law does not require it. And with all that uh, information, go ahead and submit your request and make sure you maintain a copy of that request. Um, it may come in very handy down the road uh, if you find yourself uh, needing to pursue a possible um, violation uh, of the right to know law. So now I'm going to pull up a, a template, and this is from our blog, but just walk through it quickly so that you can kind of see some language here. It's, it's a generalization, but I'll just walk through and talk through it briefly. 
Um, you know, upfront, you're addressing it to the custodian of the records. You're giving, telling them that you're asking for public access to records within five days, which is what the law requires, pursuant to the right to know law. So this makes it very clear to them that this is a right to know request. Then you're gonna list the records that you are looking for. And um, depending upon how broad you are in your scope, um, this of course will change. But what I recommend is, is wording it something like, um, you know, all records, no matter what form, including but not limited to, printed documents, electronic documents, emails, or any other form of records regarding the subject matter that you're looking for. You're making it very clear to them that you're not just looking for the spreadsheet. Um, now, maybe all you want is the spreadsheet. In that case, then you would be more specific. But if you're looking for all the records relating to a subject, certain subject matter, stating it this way, doesn't give them any out for coming back later and saying, well, you didn't ask for that, that record because you only asked for a report or you only asked for a list and this isn't a report or this isn't a list, this is an email. You're saying all records. Um, and then you would list out each one um, in, in detail. Um, and then the next section is per RSA 91A colon four, uh, we're, we're referencing the law and saying, if you deny any portion of this request, please cite the specific exemption used to justify the denial to make each record or part thereof available, available for inspection, along with a brief explanation of how the exemption applies to the information withheld. That's uh, very critical. So if they deny records, they've got to explain it to you and you're making it clear to them that you know that and you're setting that expectation. And then of course you would provide your contact information at the bottom and then there's just some information here stating what a governmental record is and that's quoting again the R uh, RSA 91A which is the right to know law. So again, this is on our blog. Uh, it's there as a reference. Uh, you can cut and paste that and, and then uh, you know, modify it to, to your suit your needs. Okay, now you've, you've submitted the request. Um, the custodian at some point is gonna respond. And the custodian, when they respond, they cannot require you to fill out a form or provide any personal information. And the custodian shall, according to law, provide records immediately when the records are available for immediate release or within five business days, they have to do one or more of the following options. They have to provide the records you requested, deny the request, deny access to some records or portions thereof. And if they do, as I mentioned earlier, they have to cite the specific exemption authorizing that denial, or they can tell you, hey, we got your request and it's gonna take us longer. And so to fulfill the request or deny the request, but we need more time to consider that and they will provide an estimate of the time necessary to do so. Now, based upon their response to you, you may end up going back and having further dialogue with them about uh, your request, maybe providing further clarification or drilling down deeper into the reasons they uh, excluded certain records and the like. Now, when they provide you records, that has to be a result of a reasonably conducted search. So, um, you know, they have to they have to do a decent job of of searching for the records, uh, and if they they don't, then that could be a, a problem. Um, there is no requirement on the part of the public body to create any new records. Again, this, this is you want to avoid asking questions or asking them to compile data that doesn't already exist or records that don't already exist. 
and it must be in the format um, it already uh, exists or calculate reasonably calculated to comply with the request. And if you decide that you're gonna inspect the rec records, you can uh, you're, you go to their place of business during regular business hours to do so. If you ask for copies, um, you, um, you can make copies yourself by any method um, such as using your cell phone or you can um, bring some other device to do so. Um, if you ask them to make copies, they can charge you the actual cost. Now, in some cases, there might be a statutory fee that applies. And if so, then no other cost shall be charged. Example is, uh, I believe like if you wanted to request a, marriage, a copy of a marriage license, there's a certain set fee um, for that. Uh, electronic records, if you want them, uh, they, they have to be provided in electronic form if that's what you request. Um, and once you get the records, there's no restriction on what you do with the records. So if you wanna take them and publish them on your blog, you wanna send them to your friends and family, whatever you can, you can do so. Now, there's a number of common pitfalls that, and I've compiled these here based upon my years of uh, dealing with a lot of people who have uh, filed right to no requests. And I've touched upon these already, but I'm gonna summarize them here. First, not knowing your rights before you submit the request. You wanna know what records you have a right to, and that will help formulate your request properly. Not putting your request in writing. I think that's a big mistake. Yeah, you can call up the administrator at the town hall and say, I want this uh, record, um, but uh, it's better to put it in writing. Uh, submit your request to the wrong agency or public body. Uh, they may or may not respond. And, and if they do, they'll probably tell you they don't have any records that meet that requirement, they may not necessarily volunteer that you need to talk to some other agency. So be careful about that. Uh, asking questions instead of asking for records. Failing to be specific enough when you describe your records. Uh, if you are not specific enough, they can come back and reject the request as not being reasonably described. Uh, Paying for copies when all you want to do is inspect the records. Failing to verify the record exemptions claimed by the custodian. They, they say back to you, uh, yeah, those records are exempt. And they leave it at that. And then you don't go back to them and say, hey, cite me the specific exemption. And then when they do, does it make sense to you? Um, and, and decide whether or not you want to pursue that further. And of course, the biggest mistake of all is giving up. Um, a lot of people, if they run into um, difficulty in, in working with their, uh, the public body, uh, they sometimes you know, let that frustration um, stop their efforts. And all I can say is don't give up. And again, we're here to help uh, and feel free to reach out to us. So at this point, I'm gonna uh, pass it back to Donna uh, for opening it up for questions and I'll try to answer um, as many as I can in the time allotted. Well, thank you, David, that was fascinating. Um, we do have a number of questions. Um, the, um, the first question was from um, E. Power. Um, are lawsuit settlements by a town and or school districts available via right to know? Can the existence of such settlements be discovered via right to know? Yes, they're, um, they're available through right to know and they have to be maintained uh, on file for 10 years. So there's no such thing as a um, 
a gag order that um, can apply to a public body so that they are unable to disclose the settlement? Um, there's there's some there's some issue there, um, and I don't have the answer to that because I know that there have been some settlements in the past where, as a result of the settlement, there was a gag order. But I believe there's actually a bill uh, in front of the legislature this year that is going to terminate that practice. Um, so I th I think this is a situation where there. Um, Maybe it's it's a bit of a if it's it could be a bit of a gray area. So if you ask for the um, the settlement, uh, then uh, and you don't get it, and they're claiming a, a gag order, there you know there might be some um, a legal maneuvering that you have to do to try to pursue that further. Okay, thank you. Um, All right. Would uh, this best scare scare asks would an alderman be forced forced to release his or her text messages if he or she is texting on a cell phone during a public meeting? So could or would an alderman be forced to release? Uh, well, I've got to clarify that a little bit. First of all, if 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 the alderman is texting to other members of the board, that's a violation of the law uh, because, uh, and of course this is getting into meetings and I don't wanna take up time talking about meetings since we're focusing on records, but I just wanna uh, clarify that if they're texting um, to other members, then that's uh, a problem with the open uh, meeting as aspect of the right to know law. Um, if they're um, sending a text to, you know, their spouse or something like that, um, then no, I wouldn't think that that would, that would not be a, a record available because it's not being sent to a quorum of the public body. So it's not a public record. Mm. All right, thank you. Um, again, from E. Parr. I made a right to know request for a town road plan I know exists. The town said they don't want to provide it because it was from August and has been updated and is being reviewed. Why can't I get the August map? That's a, that's a good point. I would think that that would be a record that is um, uh, public record. Uh, again, with some of these questions, you know, it can get down into some specifics that we certainly don't have time to, to drill down into during this meeting. So I would say to, to everybody asking questions, if you're, you know, not satisfied or you, you want to drill down further with either Donna or myself, um, you know, reach out to us after uh, this, this meeting. Um, uh, because if this initial version which is being updated, if that initial version was shared with the quorum of the public body and they, they discussed it and they acted upon it in a, in a public meeting, then that would be a public record. If it's a draft document that uh, an individual, uh, let's say the administrator is putting together, hasn't shared it with uh, anyone uh, yet, um, that might fall under the 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 realm of it being a draft um, a draft document. So there, I think there's some particulars there that makes the answer. It depends. Right, and so um, Mr. Paul says it was shown during a planning board meeting, um, and Lori Ortolano said that um, her city would say that it is now a draft and is being changed. So I guess there's a little wiggle room here between what is a draft. Um, and, uh, but you're saying if it was presented during a public meeting, it is a public document, even if it is a draft, right? Yes, I think if it was brought up during a public meeting and, and they were discussing it, right, then it 
it, it meets the criteria that uh, it was provided to a quorum of the board. If we go back to the first slide I had about what is a governmental record. It was provided to a quorum of the board um, for discussion. So one would definitely be able to make the argument it was furtherance of their official function because they were discussing it to take action. Um, so it meets uh, that uh, criteria. Uh, there is uh, some um, uh, in the right to know law uh, where it talks about um, preliminary drafts or notes um, and other documents not in their final form, but then it says, I'll, I'll read you the exact language to clarify this. Um, uh, preliminary drafts, notes, and memoranda and other documents not in their final form and not disclosed, circulated, or available to a quorum or a majority of the members of the public body. So it goes back to what I said, if the administrator had put this together, hadn't shared it with the board yet, and you know was going through various iterations to get it to the point where it would be eventually shared, then that could be considered you know, a draft um, uh, or preliminary document and, and, and not an exempt. But as soon as it's presented to a quorum of the board, I don't care what condition it's in, you, the argument is that it was shared um, uh, with the, in dis well, disclosed to the quorum uh, of the board. And so that makes it a public document. Unless it can be exempt for other reasons, right? There's certain documents that are exempt regardless of whether they're draft or not, but um, keep that in mind. Thank you. And, and this is my question. Um, I get a lot of um, questions about who, who do I address the right to know uh, uh, request to in a school district? Does it go to the SAU chairman, the superintendent, or the school board chairman? Who does it go to in a school district? Uh, I would say you want to reach out to the, the administrator at the school um, and ask them if they have a, a policy on right to know requests and then get a copy of that and it will outline in there who to submit um, the records to. I know in my town they have a policy and it states right in there all right to know requests are to be submitted to the superintendent um, you know, of the school. And so when I had issues with my local uh, school district, um, I sent them to the superintendent because that's what their policy stated. They also happen to be the custodian of the records. Um, right, thank you. If they don't have a policy, then I would, um, if there is no policy to be safe, you would want to copy the request to the public body themselves. So in this case, you might send it to the administrator or, or somebody who works at the school, the principal or whoever, but then you would copy the school board, the governing body, because they ultimately have the responsibility to make sure that request gets filled. Another way to think of this is think about if things uh, get to a point where you, you uh, um, have uh, an issue and you need to um, uh, file a complaint or possibly go to court, who are you gonna be taking to court? You're gonna be taking to court the public body. You're not gonna be taking the principal of court or the, admin, the admin, admin person, the secretary at the school. You're gonna be taking the uh, public uh, body, which is the school district to court. Thank you. Um, so E. Power writes again, um, can the public body charge for providing electronic files, labor to scan paper records, and etc.? Uh, the, the law says that they can only charge for actual costs. Um, now, as far as electronic documents, uh, they uh, can require that you provide them with a vehicle, um, in this case, like a thumb drive or um, to store the electronic document on, um, in which case there would be a cost uh, to do so. And they 
typically request that it be in something that's not been used or is an unopened package because they're concerned about you know viruses and things invading their computers. Um, they cannot charge for labor. Uh, they can only charge the actual cost of making the copy, not for time um, to find and retrieve the records. Thank you. Um, the general charge, though, is is about fifty cents a page, isn't it? In uh, many places, that's probably you know a, a good estimate of an average. And of course, we've seen through our studies and such that we've done um, charges anywhere from you know like a, a nickel or ten cents a page up to you know several dollars a page. Um, Tracy Walbridge has asked, are emails considered a public record? Yes. Well, that was the criteria that is outlined, uh, that I outlined on what a governmental record is. So if it's an email from the administrator that he used the, the you know, his town email to send uh, a message to his, uh, his significant other, uh, he's going to be home late because he's working you know, uh, that's not in furtherance of uh, a public function. Um, so that wouldn't be um, a public record, but uh, anything relating with, with the, the business of government would be. Thank you. Um, Lori Ortolano asks, can you explain the difference between compiling records and searching for records? Um, yeah, and I think it goes back to whatever is in the, you know, Webster's Dictionary. Um, uh, searching for records is, is, is finding the records. Um, compiling is massaging data or to, to turn it into something else that adds, that adds value. That's how I would view it. Um, mm. Um, going back to the costs uh, for information, Moira Ryan says Manchester School District is looking at a policy to charge a research fee. Is that legal? No. Right. At this point, it isn't unless they change the law. Yeah. Um, they can't charge for. They can't charge for time. This is an area that we see often that public bodies are trying to, um, you know, hit the public up for reimbursing them for their time. And, and they do it several ways. I mean, a few, very few come right out and try to charge you money for their time. Um, and then others, they jack up the per page copy cost to something that exceeds the actual cost. Let's face it, um, if they're charging, I'll, I'll give you a good example. You go to a police department and they, you ask for a police report, it's two pages, but they, they have in their, in their fee is $15 for uh, a police report. Well, actual cost is not $15 to generate two pages. Um, and you, I would argue that that is not an appropriate actual cost. Um, but right to know New Hampshire, we, we see this happening all over the state where there's exorbitant charges taking place and it's in an area that we uh, focus some of our attention on. Right, there's the law and then there's the enforcement of the law and those are two yes. different things we found, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, Karen, Toman asks, if you get a copy of a record and it is unreadable because of the penmanship, is there recourse? Um, I would say, hmm, I, I would say no, assuming it's unreadable um, because of the penmanship and not because of the blurriness of a copy. So that's a case where you would want to inspect the original record to make sure, because sometimes, you know, a copy of a copy of a copy and things get blurred that way. Mm. 
Mm. And I, unless I've overlooked something, uh, in which case I invite um, the individual to please unmute themselves. I think we've come to the end of the questions unless I've, I've uh, missed something. So um, I, I'm going to invite, I'm going to unmute everyone if I can now. Um, can I just take that. a brief moment to wrap up? Uh, all right, thank you, David, go right ahead. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining this uh, webinar and feel free to reach out to our organization. If you'd like to join our group, membership is free. Um, you can uh, email us. Um, I will uh, provide um, a PDF of this uh, presentation to Donna and I understand she has contact information for everyone. So. If any of you would, you know, like a copy, uh, you can certainly request that of, of Donna. Um, and I would ask you in your towns or cities to, you know, if you're attending meetings, read the minutes and, and, and verify um, they're complying as best as you can with the right to know law. And, and if not, our organization is available to help you um, understand if they're uh, violating the law or not and and help you to gain compliance uh, with that public body. Uh, one thing that we've undertaken uh, recently uh, in the last few years is to push for the establishment of an ombudsman because right now with the right to know law if you um, try to get satisfaction with uh, your local public body um, as far as access to records and, and you're not successful, you have to file a petition in court and that's very time consuming, it's costly, and quite honestly, it's a deterrent uh, for most citizens. So uh, our top priority of the last several years has been uh, getting an ombudsman established. And I would ask each of you, um, there's a bill this year called HB 481 to establish the Office of the Right to Know Ombudsman. This would be an individual, an independent arbiter that would help you um, resolve complaints that you filed against uh, um, a public body, a public agency. Um, and feel free, again, to reach out to us um, through the various avenues we have, email, our blog, Facebook. Um, I welcome your your, your questions and your help. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much, you. David. That was, that was excellent. And um, Moira Ryan asks, who would the ombudsman be for, the school and the state government? The ombudsman is going to be an independent arbiter, is going to be a position that will reside within the Secretary of State's office and uh, it will allow the citizen to uh, file a complaint with the ombudsman and do so at very little cost. And the ombudsman would be able to uh, process that complaint and reach out in, in, if we're talking about the case of records, for example, let's say they didn't provide the records you wanted or they stated some records are exempt and you don't believe they should be exempt. Um, or maybe they're just taking too long. They're dragging their feet. It's been a month and you still don't have access to records. You can, you would be able to file your complaint with the ombudsman and they would reach out uh, to the uh, public body, uh, forward your, you know, the nature of your complaint to them. And then the public body would have a chance to respond. And then sort of like a mediator, uh, uh, they would um, deal with both parties, hear both sides, but then they would uh, uh, make a ruling and that ruling, uh, which would be based in law, uh, they would make a ruling as to whether or not uh, the public body is in violation. And if so, they could order any of the remedies that are available if you were to go to court. So the benefit to the citizen is one, you get to file a complaint at little or, little or no cost you get a timely uh, resolution of, of that complaint. Your complaint, if, if the, they find against the public body and in your favor, then 
they can order the public body a, any of the remedies that you would have had you gone to court, you, the ombudsman can rule in the same way. And then um, if by uh, chance you don't agree with the ombudsman, you feel that they ruled against you or uh, you can still go to court. So you're not eliminating the ability to have your day in court. You've just got another avenue that you can pursue that's faster and cheaper and easier um, as a first step in your process to get your complaint resolved. Would you mind repeating that bill number, please? HB 481. Okay. And this year, because of COVID, uh, normally if you wanted to, um, you know, testify or, you know, you'd reach out to your legislator and you tell them that you're, you, you want them to support this bill, I would ask you to do so. Um, you'll also be able to go online and register uh, your position of support um, uh, online when, with the bill when it comes up. And if you follow on our blog, we have another section on our blog. I didn't talk about it, but we have a legislative se uh, sector section on the blog, which outlines all of the right to know bills that are currently in front of the legislature this year. And this HB 481 is one of them, but you can click on there and it'll take you to the text of the bill. It'll show you the details on what committee is hearing the bill, the status of the bill. Um, and if you um, visit that page regularly throughout the legislative session the, through January, February, March, um, we'll be updating that um, to let you know how things are proceeding. Uh, and I would ask all of you to reach out to your respective legislators and tell them to support this bill. Thank you. And while you're doing it, I hope you also ask them to support HB uh, 206, which is our collective bargaining bill. Um, uh, there are a few more comments, David, maybe if um, we could ask you. Um, sure. Eric Power, again, asked, is getting towns and school districts to comply with right to know a small, medium, or large problem in New Hampshire? Um, well, that's a very relative type of thing. I would, I would say that the, the, the majority of public bodies um, are probably doing a, a, a decent job of dealing with right to know issues, but that doesn't matter to you if you happen to be in the one town or one school district that is, is not being responsive. So it's, it's very personal. Um, I mean, a good example is myself, I had issues with my local school district um, and I, yeah, I had some minor issues, but overall they, I thought did a reasonably good job at responding to my right to know requests. But then I can pass it over to Donna Green and she can tell you about her encounters that required her. And she was a member of the school board to boot. And, you know, she had to fight tooth and nail um, to get access to information and had to go all the way to uh, Superior Court and then Supreme Court to finally get a ruling. And on, on the behalf of uh, Donna's effort and the others uh, that helped her out, you know, we now have the ability to get access to spreadsheets in electronic form that before some places were not following the spirit of the law and providing access. And so uh, they were denying access to um, electronic records such as uh, spreadsheets. So Lori Ortolano, who also has a lot of experience with an obstructionist um, city administration asks, can a city redact records for only one citizen's request and not do it to any other citizens requests that are asking for the same or similar records? Can a city redact no. records for only and one citizen's request and not do it for any of the other citizens requests that are asking for the same or similar records? 
no, definitely not. And I, uh, I, because if information is to be redacted and there's a valid reason for doing so, whether it's redacted or not is not at all based on the eyes that are seeing it. It's either public or it's not. So uh, I would suggest that you try to gather evidence of that exact thing. The ideal way to do that is to have two different people file the exact same request worded identically um, covering the same documents, timeframes, stuff. And then, of course, each of those people would get the records that are provided to them and then do that comparison. And if there are differences, then it's one of two things, right? It's either a oversight on the part of the person filling the request. Um, and even if it's an oversight, it's a violation of the law. Um, and, and then it's just a matter of now, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to point that out to them or are you going to go to court over it or, you know, what your um, process is to deal with that? Um, so Lori responds, she did do exactly that and it was amazing. And then um, Amanda Reichert uh, said that happened to her as well. So I had never, I've never heard of this before. Yeah. Oh, and um, you know, this is the, you know, this is what we deal with and it's the part that's sort of under the covers never gets talked about, um, but it does go on and that is um, right to know requests are not, um, they're not handled in a uniform manner. And sometimes um, it, it uh, they're handled differently by the same person because of how, uh, you know, that, that person um, wants to deal with that request that is being done in a manner that is quite honestly un unlawful, right? Whether they're not being thorough in the job they're doing or whether they're being prejudicial in some way. I mean, that's the part that it's hard to prove one over the other, but um, you know, there are things like that going on. Mm. Um, Karen Toman is asking, can you ask about a process that is followed in a right to know request? So I would imagine that that's once the um, custodian of the information gets the request, um, is uh, that's how I'm interpreting Can it. Can I clarify a little bit? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. So I'm trying to get uh, information about voting procedures that are uh, that are done, in which I'm not sure there. The, the copy that I got of the um, same day registration list from Nashua it one whole ward is just it's like somebody had parkinson's disease when they were writing all the names and addresses down now i can't believe that that list was used to enter people into a database hmm. and yeah. so they gave me something ill un, unintelligible okay and so you know can i using the right to no request it's sort of like asking a question but what is the process that the city follows somebody comes in to register to vote you know they have to fill out the registration form and all that but uh, yeah, oh, I think the, I, know. I and, and, and this is a good question, and I know your question is relating to voting, but this is applicable in, in, in all areas. Um, usually there are other state laws that address what you're dealing with. So for example, if it has to do with planning board and uh, you know, zoning and, and such, there's gonna be planning board regulations and zoning regulations that exist. 
the first place to start is the, um, the RSAs. These are the uh, state statutes. So in your case, you'd look at the state statutes on election law. Uh, and again, we have links to this on our blog. If you look under the resources tab, there's a resource that gives you a link to all of the state RSAs. And then from there, you can drill down to election law. And then in election law, it'll show uh, each RSA with its title. So you'd go down probably the section around voter registration. And I'm, again, I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head mm -hmm. here. In the section, somewhere there's a law that's going to talk specifically to how people register to vote, how uh, they, they, they're going to verify their who they are at the time right. of voting, right? And then uh, further, there may, there may be other... Um, uh, regulations, because sometimes there's multiple regulations, but you do that research and you find, and that's, uh, that's how you're going to answer your question. You're going to find out, okay, for somebody to vote, they have to be on this list. This list has to be handled a certain way. And, and you'll answer your question by reading that. And then uh, using the list in your case, where the, the names are all unreadable, you're gonna compare that to the RSA and it's going to say, well, they have to verify that the person is registered to vote, for example. Then you're gonna say, well, how could you using this list verify that that person was registered when it's uh, illegible? Right. And then, but now you're in, you're in election law, you're using the right to know law to gain access to the voter registration records, right? But you're gonna use election law to claim there's a violation somewhere with the election law. And then you're gonna probably have to find out who those dealing with violations of the election law. In this case, it might be the secretary of state or somebody else um, and contact them. And, 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 but you're gonna to wanna to provide that evidence to them that you believe there's a violation. And this is where the right to know law is that tool to help you collect that evidence by getting access to records. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I know our time is up, David. Can I uh, just ask you one final um, question? If it follows up on this in a way. Um, so Eric Power says, is the fact that I made a right to know request a public record and can it be conveyed to everyone? In our town, we were told only candidates on the ballot are allowed to get a list of voters who requested absentee ballots. A common citizen cannot request per the town clerk. Any clarification on that? And that's again where right to know butts up against election law. Yeah. And uh, one thing you have to keep in mind there are places where the, the, the right to know law says, says one thing, and then another statute says something else. And specifically, and this is an area where people get tripped up because in the right to know law, it does specifically state when you're looking for records that, you know, the records, these are public records, unless they're either listed as an exemption in the right to know law or they're exempted via other statutes. So um, I've had a number of cases where people come and say, well, you know, I want this record. It's not listed as an exemption in the right to know law. So it must be a public record. And the answer is not necessarily. You have to look elsewhere in other statutes. So in this case, you'd have to look at the election law as it relates to um, this record that you're requesting of the absentee ballots in, uh, and there's a section of the election law on how absentee ballots are processed, handled, and whether or not they're uh, you know, they're available uh, via uh, RSA 91A, which is the right to know law. Um, so there are going to be times where you've got to understand the right to know law, but you also have to understand some other um, state statute as it relates to the, the area you're delving into in order to get the full picture. And then in some type cases on top of that, you know, there could be federal requirements I mentioned earlier about like HIPAA laws with health related information of employees. 
you know, I know when I was asking for information uh, relating to uh, um, line item detail on uh, uh, school expenditures, you know, when it got down to the health uh, insurance line on there, because some departments only had one or uh, two people in that department, they didn't provide some of that detail because you could literally back into, oh, Jane Doe is the only person in that department. And oh, look at Jane Doe has this amount of money taken out of her pay. So that implies she's got a certain type of health plan and that's a violation of HIPAA. So you have to be, you have to be aware of those kind of intricacies and interactions. And uh, there's another part to that question that uh, um, hasn't been addressed yet, but just um, as well as that, um, your website has a lot of case law. And that's also part of the of the right to know law, even if it isn't actually explicit in the the um, you know statute. The case law has made the right to know law um, different, and in many cases more robust. Um, yeah, yeah, and and your no, website has a wonderful uh, re, uh, library of those law uh, rulings. Yeah, and I, I think for the you know the, the person goes through several levels, you know, first they're a novice. They just, they, you know, yesterday they learned what the, that there's a thing called the right to know law. And so our blog is a great resource. It's going to get you up to speed and take you from a novice to being able to exercise your rights uh, with, the, with the right to know law. Um, but then you get up to the next level, which is uh, sort of the warrior, legal, legal type of person where you've run into conflict with the public body on right to know, and you're pursuing access to records and or meetings, and you're 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 stating one position, um, and the public body is stating a different position, and now you need to have a better understanding of the law and its intricacies in order to try to understand: Am I right? Are they right? Or is this in, is there a gray area in the middle that needs to be further reconciled? And and our blog has a lot more details if you want to drill down into case law. Um, and you can read actual judge rulings about various things. I'll give you a, you know, one quick example is like 911 recordings, right? There's a 911 recording comes into the police. Is that a public record or not? Right? And if you look at the right to know law, doesn't answer that question. And one might say, well, it was received by the public body in furtherance of its, you know, uh, public function. Uh, it's a right to know record. Well, no, there's case law that talks specifically about uh, some parameters around 911 recordings that, um, you know, one can be released to the person that, uh, you know, is on the recording. Uh, but two, if there's multiple people and stuff like that, there's a need to protect uh, privacy and such. And so there's details in the case law that would further refine whether or not you can get access to say certain 911 calls. And again, our group, we provide assistive services. If you're getting down to that level of detail and having a problem uh, with a, a local um, uh, state agency, uh, public body, um, you know, we certainly can be a resource to help you uh, sort through that stuff. So one last question, is the fact that I made a right to know request a public record? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, well, at that, <laughs> I'm going to thank you so much for your time, David. This has been really quite enlightening and thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, and the members of um, my organization and our, our new friends, uh, I'm sure are very grateful for your time and expertise tonight. Thank you. And uh, again, I hope everyone will go to Right to Know uh, New Hampshire's website and also visit the SDGA nh.org website as well. Thank you so much. And I'm going to call it a night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.